Oh, hello. I'm afraid you've caught me thinking about Spider-Man Homecoming again. Only thinking because up to this point, it's kind of been scary as fuck to talk about it out loud. Oh, yeah. See, when Spider-Man Homecoming came out, it was a momentous occasion. Marvel had finally figured out a way to bring Spidey into their cinematic universe, and everybody wanted it to be the Spider-Man movie of their dreams, the one that finally got the character right. And lots of people refused to see it any other way. But that's okay. That's fine. That's okay. That's, that's great. But then, War for the Planet of the Apes came out and blew everybody's minds, and Dunkirk came out, and the Academy's already polishing and engraving the Oscars, and Valerian came out, and... Wait, did, Valer did Valerian come out? Did that come out already? Anyway, enough time has passed now, and I think it's finally safe to talk about Spider-Man Homecoming without fear of being kicked in the fucking nuts. And, you know, because while I think it was an okay movie, uh, I've got some issues with it. You know, right off the bat is the choice to make Spider-Man Homecoming not an origin movie, but yet also uh, make it an origin movie. See, they nix all the stuff about Uncle Ben being shot and the radioactive spider, and thank fuck for that because the only person who's been killed on screen more times than Uncle Ben is fucking Sean Bean, and holy fuck, they should get Sean Bean to play Uncle Ben. <laughs> Spider-Man Homecoming wants to have it both ways. It wants to think it's, it's respecting the audience by not making us sit through that entire origin story all over again, yet at the same time it's also kind of insulting the audience by giving us a Spider-Man who's a bumbling fool and not yet fully in control of his powers. After seeing him in Civil War take on the likes of Winter Soldier and the Falcon and even fucking Captain America and looking awesome. But Spider-Man Homecoming reverts Spidey to somebody who's not yet fully in control of his powers and still trying to figure shit out. Even though he's at least six months removed from that spider bite and that choice to become a hero. And what's more, the character's honestly kind of robbed of any sort of depth as a result. He is an upbeat and funny character, but there still should be a sense of gravity to him. You know, his decision to become Spider-Man and stay Spider-Man is born out of a sense of guilt for what happened to Uncle Ben. You know, he goes out every single day to prevent what happened to Uncle Ben from happening to anybody else. Civil War did a really good job of making that point quickly without beating it into our heads. But Spider-Man Homecoming kind of ignores it all together. Spider-Man's entire motivation in Homecoming is honestly kind of a selfish one. I mean, he wants to impress Tony Stark and become an Avenger. And that'd be a fine character arc for somebody else, but if there's two things that have always defined Spider-Man through the generations, it's his sense of right or wrong and his selflessness. Anytime Peter Parker's ever made a selfish choice, whether it's allowing Uncle Ben's future murder to get away or giving into the power of the symbiote suit, he's always received a swift kick in the ass for it. And here in Homecoming, he's rewarded for it. And that brings me to my next issue, and that's the character who's doing all the rewarding, which is Tony Stark. For whatever reason, Marvel absolutely refuses to grow Iron Man as a character. In Iron Man 3, we saw him build an entire army of automated suits to compensate for his feelings of inadequacy as a hero, and he learned that was wrong, so he blew them all up. In Age of Ultron, we found out that him building a completely autonomous robot to make the lives of the Avengers easier was wrong, and an entire fucking city got destroyed. All of these mistakes that Tony Stark has made has cost thousands of innocents their lives, it cost him his relationship with Pepper Potts, and it nearly cost him his teammates and their loyalties. And yet in Homecoming, he's right back to fucking around with automated suits again, and Pepper Potts is back, and everybody's happy, and... And what's more is the fact that he's given all this technology to a kid that's barely old enough to drive. We've seen time and again that Tony's technology is dangerous enough in his own hands, and yet he's handing it off to a little kid who's barely in control of his own powers at this point. And at one point, Tony Stark does get wise to the fact that Peter's not ready for all this, and he takes the suit away. Which was honestly kind of a smart move, because up to this point, Peter Parker's literally done nothing of any value, and he's fucked up at every turn. But, in the climax of the film, Peter actually fucks up again, and he disobeys Tony Stark, and he goes after the Vulture, trying to stop him from stealing a whole jet full of Stark tech and Avengers gear, and because of Peter, the plane ends up crash landing, and all the stuff is demolished and destroyed, and uh, he gets into a fight with the Vulture, and the Vulture very quickly and easily beats the fuck out of him, and he only defeats the Vulture out of some really lazy and convenient writing. And then Tony Stark rewards him for this by giving him an even more powerful suit and inviting him to become an Avenger. What the shit? Yeah. And I haven't even touched on the fact that giving Spider-Man an Iron Man suit negates everything that's interesting about the character to begin with. I mean, you remember in Civil War when 
he went toe to toe with Winter Soldier, and he was faster and stronger than him, and he was badass, and and he was quick witted enough that uh, he led the charge against Giant Man, and everybody followed his lead, and they took him down, and they won the battle, and it was all fucking awesome. And in Homecoming, instead of relying on his quick wits and his preternatural spider sense and his agility and his genius level intellect, he lets the suit that Tony give him do everything for him. During the film set piece of the Washington Monument, the suit literally guides him through every single step of saving his friends. How is that compelling? Shit, even Jarvis never held Tony Stark's hand that much, and Tony Stark doesn't even have any superpowers. I really wanted to like Spider-Man Homecoming. I really did. And I think Tom Holland was absolutely pitch-fucking-perfect casting for the role. All the high school drama stuff, all the stuff about leading dual lives is perfect, and Tom Holland is fantastic in it. But it's every time that Spider-Man puts on the suit that everything kind of falls apart, and that's really only winning half the battle in what should have been a great movie. But don't get me wrong, I think the next Spider-Man movie has the capability of absolutely being possibly the best one we've ever seen. It won't be saddled with the idea of not being an original movie, but also still being an original movie. It won't have to rely on characters like Tony Stark coming in and being like a, like a surrogate to bring Spider-Man into the universe. And I think the writers are going to be more free and capable of writing in you know, less of the kind finds of the box they were when they were trying to write this one. So you may still feel the need to kick me in the nuts for saying all this, and uh, that's okay. You know, here at the second draft, we're all about discussion and debate, and as long as we can have a beer afterwards and still be friends, it's all good. So please, feel free to leave a comment down below, or uh, come on over to our house at thesecondraft.com, and try not to piss on a cough. Cheers. I recorded this entire video while wearing no pants.